And now you think that you three write four essays that are significantly better in less than 24 hours? Yes, no you cannot. And besides, tomorrow is Saturday. Campus is closed until the next semester starts. What grade did I get on my final? I haven't graded them yet. You just turned them in two hours ago. Yes, but I'm worried about my grade. How do you think you hit on the final? I'm not sure. I didn't quite finish, but you left the final early before the time was out. I know. I had to make a phone call. The final exam essay was supposed to be four pages long. How much did you get done? I believe. All right, I'm going to quickly jump to the end here. Sure. You never once tried to get help or improve your grade. That's not true. Can you guys hear the audio? I to do extra credit, and you won't let me. Okay. You are a terrible teacher. I'm going to write a bad review of you on the Rate My Teacher website. Let me stop the screen share. To, um, I have to admit that is one of my favorite YouTube videos of all time. Because I've been the professor in that video maybe not all the same details but um there's a part of me that doesn't care what grade you get in the class because deep down i know in my heart that grades don't define people with that said i know that there's a part of you that does care what grade you get in the class and I actually want everybody to succeed and to get what they want out of the class. So especially if grades are important to you and you think something's wrong with your grade, talk to me about it now or you know when you realize it. Instead of waiting until the term is over and you didn't receive the grade you wanted and the grades have been submitted to Banner and it's on your, your do they just still do report cards or do you just get like an email? I don't even know. Remember when I was a student, I had to get to the mailbox before the report card showed up so I could get it before my parents saw it if there was a bad grade on it. Do they still do that? It's just on Banner Web now. It's on Banner Web. You just log in. So there's no intercepting the mail before your parents see it? It's much less exciting. You have to like change the password so they can't log in. <laughs> you, can't, you can't like take that paper report card and and like like use like whiteout and like try to change it from like a D to a B. No, there's no paper. You have to be very high tech about it. Yeah, man, you guys are screwed. Because I there used to be back in the day, copy and paste included using paste. Or we would copy something. We would cut it out. And we would paste it on the piece of paper over the thing that we want to think. And then we copy it again. And if you were really good with white out on the edges, nobody could tell that you changed a word or a grade. Uh, not that I was into forgery or anything when I was growing up. I just observed, I'm asking for a friend. We just say, I'm asking you, for a friend. You just happen to be a very practiced white out user. Yeah. So, I don't want to digress too far because we got a lot of stuff to cover today, but I worked for a company that the guy ran out of his house, but he had an office manager to be in the office when, when we were away at a job. And so the office manager's job was to answer the phones and, and handle the mail and stuff like that. And he fired her because of like the third time he caught her doing laundry in his laundry room when she was supposed to be at work, like doing her, washing her clothes in his laundry room when she was supposed to be at work. And then for chronically not being there at five o'clock when he arrived, but having said that she was there until five on her time card. So he fired her for that. And a month after he fired her, we realized that she had been embezzling from the company and she had taken over $10,000 by writing checks to herself and then strategically spilling white out on the bank statements over those checks on every single, on both sides. So you couldn't like hold it up to the light and read what it said. 
and the attorney general decided not to prosecute because she had a little kid and he didn't want to put her in jail. Which I suppose is good because having mothers in jail, they're not raising their little kids, but what kind of lessons is she teaching her kid? Uh, all right, so let's get, let's get to topic though. Um, so partially I had that video up because I love that video and it got me in a good mood before the class started. But the other reason is there may be people who correctly answered the quiz question about the speed at the center of the end mill that's plunging down, but did not get credit for answering that question correctly. Since I'm lazy, I don't wanna go look for those people. So if you self-identify as one of those people and you tell me by the end of, I was gonna say by the end of this week, but let's give it until the middle of next week, by next Wednesday, I will go fix your grade. But if you tell it to me on the day after grades are posted, I'm not going to have as much sympathy for you. Um, especially since, yeah, anyway. All right. So um, what are we talking about today? It was titled Modeling in Science and Engineering. Something about science and engineering and modeling. Yesterday, you had also said you would. I, I am going to finish up the stuff college. we got to yesterday. And I'm going to have to assign somebody to ask at the beginning of class. Did you click record? Is there somebody that's not going to miss any classes? You can you can raise your hand in the participants poll if you don't think you're going to miss any classes. So currently all of you intend to miss at least one class. I don't think we ever intend to, we just don't want to promise we won't. Click yes, click yes in the, in the participants thing if you don't intend to miss any classes. It shows a little hand symbol. Oh, there's a hand now. All right, click yes. All right, um, who do I want to pick? All right. Emily, Emily Coughlin. Your job, yeah. your job at the beginning of every class, does it show when I'm recording or when I'm live on YouTube on the screen? On your screen? It shows it, on my screen. It I shows just don't it. always remember to look for it. In the top left, it says live on YouTube. Yeah, so it's live on YouTube. If you don't see that or if you don't see it say recording, your job um, is We say, can see that you're live on YouTube, but I think usually when it's recording, there's a little like- Yeah, if you, if you think, for an instant that I'm not recording the lecture, please stop me and tell me to record because I meant to record yesterday's lecture. Um, but as I said, I got up at four in the morning yesterday to get ready for the lecture and I wasn't actually ready for it when it started. I, I had too much stuff to do in those four hours before we started yesterday and um, I forgot to click record. So what I did instead is I posted a link to a video I made about the same topic. Um, which was seven minutes long, which tells me that if I critically look at the video I didn't make yesterday of yesterday's lecture, there's probably seven minutes worth of actual content in the lecture. Um, and, but I don't think the, so the content is there, but none of the antics that I used to try to get you to emotionally accept the content are in this other video. That video is strictly content. Um, and I, I've, I've done this before. Usually I can get about 20 minutes out of an hour of content, but I'm probably more generous to myself when I do that. Um, why do I jump around during lecture? Um, I don't know. My internet connection cut out for a little bit, so I don't know if someone's already told you, but you're not recording right now. It says I'm live on YouTube though. Do you have to be doing both or well, I can one? Do one or the other? I can't record. Oh, okay. That. Sounds good. Um, and my, proof, my preference is to be live on YouTube. Um, if occasionally it doesn't log into YouTube when I click the button and then I just click the record button, but then I have steps to make it get posted later. And if I do the live on YouTube thing, it's automatically posted and I don't have to do anything. And um, I, I try to avoid this word, but they do say that lazy people make the best inventors. 
And the reason is that they're always trying to find an easier solution to the problem. And so I take pride in the fact that I'm always trying to find an easier solution to the problem, but I, lazy is such a negative word in our, in our speech. So um, I'll, I'll call myself an entrepreneurial person because they're also trying to find an easier solution to the problem usually. All right, so, uh, but yeah, and actually I've got the YouTube windows open so I can see myself with like a five second delay over here. It gets really weird when I forget to mute that window and you can hear me again with a five second delay. Um, all right, so Emily, it's your job to make sure that we're recording. And if you do miss a, a day, contact one of your classmates and ask them to make sure. Um, the other entrepreneurial thing about me is I like to delegate responsibility. And there's more than one Emily in the class. So that was Emily Coughlin. <laughs> and I'll be able to remember that because I have a daughter named Emily. Um, we got to the slide last week, last week, last week. We got to the slide yesterday and I, I know which slide we got to because it's still open in presentation mode on the screen um, with the $100 bill. So I'm gonna go back to that slide and we're gonna continue the topic from yesterday. Somebody, um, Isabel Chan, Isabel, don't let me get past 11.35 without starting to talk about modeling. Okay, whenever I get to by 11.35 is what we're gonna talk about on the slides that I didn't finish yesterday. All right. But then we'll have plenty of time to, to introduce what I wanted to introduce. So screen sharing, share the screen, share the screen, share the one with PowerPoint slide on it, share. Can you guys hear the machine tools outside? Good, I can hear them, but if you can't hear them, that's probably pretty good. So has anybody ever studied a hundred dollar bill? If you held one in your hand, like held it up to the light, felt the paper, who likes hundred dollar bills? In the participants window, click yes if you like hundred dollar bills. Ooh, that's too good. So most of you like hundred dollar bills, okay. Who would like thousand dollar bills if they still made them? Anybody that would, you know, they, the drug dealers killed the thousand dollar bill. They get rid of the thousand dollar bill because it was too easy for drug dealers to move large sums of money around in cash. So, uh, so we're stuck with the lowly hundred. It says on the back, although we pride ourselves of separating church and state in this country, it says right on the back of our currency, in God we trust. Has anybody ever like, like tried to zoom in and really look at a hundred dollar bill though? Have you ever like put it in a microscope? Because it says in God we trust, but if you zoom in, everybody else bring data. So God we trust, if you're not God, bring your data. And so, when we do these measurements, right, we, we can measure stuff to control our machining process. We can measure stuff to make sure we don't ship crap to the customers. But when we do these measurements, we generate data and there's things that you need to do with the data. So I wanna look at some data here. So I've got a sample data set that we can look at. And so you guys should be able to see a bunch of numbers now. Let's see if I can zoom in. Uh, maybe I won't zoom in, you can see the graph, right? So what I did is I plotted a part number. And so this is the order in which the parts came off the machine and measured outside diameter. And I plotted those on the X, Y, Z coordinates. You guys can see the graph. What, so as an engineer, I really like numbers. But what I like even more than the numbers are the pictures that the numbers paint. Oh, engineering is like paint by numbers. That's that's the start of a haiku. I gotta write that down. All right, I can use that phrase to make to make a haiku. Ooh, maybe that's an added extra credit homework assignment. 
Perfect. Extra credit homework assignment. I will put, no, not extra credit. I will put a quiz question that the answer is to answer this question here. Use the, use the phrase engineering is paint by numbers and write a haiku. Yeah, we'll do haiku. A haiku that expresses the same idea. And, and so the idea that's behind this phrase is the fact that if we can look at a picture, we can, we can draw conclusions and we can make generalizations. Sometimes you need the number to make a decision, but looking at the picture tells you a story. And so if we look at the picture, am I screen sharing? I am. Okay. Yeah. Engineering is what by numbers? I'll, I'll put it in the thing, but it's gonna be in okay. So my, the thing I used to remind myself of what I wanted to say was engineering is like paint by numbers. So you've done like the paint by numbers where you fill in the numbers, right? In, I have no idea what paint my numbers is. Uh, I'll, I'll include a picture. Clearly you're an engineer, you need the picture to understand what it is. It's a, it's a little, it's like a painting thing, an arts and crafts thing for little kids. Uh, you maybe have forgotten about it, but since I have two little kids at home, I have remembered about it. Uh, but what does the picture in this graph tell us? So it's the diameter, the outside diameter of the part and the number of parts. And you could, you could assume that we were sampling every hundred parts or every thousand parts. This doesn't, the number doesn't have to correspond to part one, part two, part three. It could be part one, part 1001, part 2001, part 3001, right? So what, is the, what does the graph tell you? And uh, I'll open up the chat in case people want to type in the chat. I can figure out how to open up the chat. So you can either shout out and tell me what the graph tells you, or you can type it in the chat, but everybody being quiet, I'm just going to take a sip of coffee. Is it that the tool, like the cutting tool is wearing down and that's why it's. All right. So longer? one conclusion we could draw, I'm going to write on the board. I'll switch over later is tool wear. And, and that's, I believe that's a valid conclusion we could draw from looking at the chart, but what does the chart actually tell us? What does the graph tell us? That as more parts were made, uh, the trend was the outside diameter was generally larger. Right, so the graph tells us that when we made more parts, when we made more parts, the diameter got bigger. Does it seem regular to you? It seems linear at least. Right, right, yeah, so regular linear, those, I, I was using the terms. And so if we want to know how fast the parts are getting bigger, we want to get a slope of that line, right? If we knew the slope of that line, we would know the rate at which those parts are getting bigger. And so we could find the slope, We'd actually go to our graph. We can right click here. Um, I always do this in Excel, except this is not Excel. So maybe right click, chart area, chart styles, legend, data range. I want to add a trend line. Hmm. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do file, download as Excel. And I'm going to open it in Excel because I totally know how to do this in Excel. While it's, while it's opening, um, has anybody ever made a resume? Shake your head, yes, you've made a resume. Yeah. Have you ever possibly exaggerated on your resume? I'm not gonna say lied, but stretched. I actually know a guy that put that he was fluent in French in his resume, and when he showed up at the job interview, the interview was conducted in French. 
So I really don't recommend putting things like fluent in French unless you're actually fluent in French on your resume. Um, the, the, the graph didn't download well, but that's fine. I'm going to delete this. All right. Enable editing. You guys can see my Excel thing now? Yeah. All right. So I've got part number, part diameter. I'm going to insert a chart. I like scatter plots the best. I'm going to right click here. I'm going to add a trend line. We think it looks linear, so I'm going to pick linear. I want to display the equation on the chart. And we'll go ahead and display the R squared value on the chart. And so um, has anybody taken statistics? If somebody's taking statistics, tell me what the R squared value means. Uh, it's a right. correlation coefficient. It's the correlation coefficient. Great. We have a label for the R squared value. Now, what does the R squared value mean? Uh, it tells you how closely a trend line matches the data points you gave it. How closely the trend line matches the data points we gave it. Okay. Um, and those are great explanations. It's basically how, how good is your equation? So the closer to one your R squared value is, the closer your equation describes the pattern that the data makes. And so if you have a really, if you choose linear on that trend line thing and you get a really low R squared value, then maybe your data is not linear or maybe there's some other factor that's influencing the change, right? But we got uh, 0 0.993, that's a really good R squared value. Um, we got a really good R squared value. What's the slope of the line? The slope is the number that's multiplied by X, right? It's so unfortunate that the engineering class has math in it, but the engineering class has math in it. So the slope of the line is 0 0.0006 X, and the intercept is at two is one point something. We don't care what the intercept is for this equation here. What we care about is the slope, and so what are the units? We didn't say what the units are, but the units are inches. And so let's say each part number represents a thousand parts. For each thousand parts, it's growing by six, is it six ten thousandths of an inch? Three zeros and a six. So for every thousand parts you make, the piece gets bigger by six ten thousandths of an inch. And when we see that trend, we believe that it probably means the tool is wearing out over time. And that, that intuitively makes sense to us, right? Because tools wear out over time. What do we do to fix it? Decide, decide a set amount of time beyond which the like diameter isn't acceptable anymore and just change the tool at that point. Right, so what we often have, let me see if I can go back to my screen share for screen share, this one. <coughs> and I'm looking for the PowerPoint that's just under that. I have too many windows open. Wait, no, I can minimize. And yeah, minimize, oh, no. Undo that last minimize, this one. It's this one, but it's that tab. Okay, let's go back over here. All right, and so, we don't have the same diameters here, but what we do have is we have these tolerance ranges, right? And so who picks the tolerances?
Does the manufacturing engineer pick the tolerances or does the designer pick the tolerances? Feel free to type in the chat too. I'm looking at that. The designer. Or, I guess designer. The designer picks the tolerances, right? The, the designer tells us, am I screen sharing? No. Now I am. Though. The designer tells us how much they're willing to let that number vary by. And so if we take those tolerances, if we go back to our Excel spreadsheet, and if we say we're willing to let that diameter vary by plus or minus one thousandth of an inch, then we can make another line at, well, we have to know what the nominal diameter is, right? So let's say the nominal diameter is 1.13, 1.130. 1 so we can make a line at 1.130 minus, let's see, draw. What time is it? Insert shapes. I don't guess I don't know Excel very well. We could draw a vertical line across here and across here to tell us whether our parts are good or bad. And we don't ship any of the bad ones to the customer. Right, so we could put a line at the tolerances on the chart. And let me, uh, it's easier for me to draw it on the board probably. Turn off the screen sharing. So we've got our thing here. We've got our data going like this. Let's say this is the nominal value. So this is, target, we can put an upper tolerance and a lower tolerance. We put this line and when we measure any parts down here and any parts up here, we don't ship them to the customer. And if we get up here, we can stop the operation, we can change the tool and we can run it again. Right? Would that solve the problem? This is way more fun in a classroom when I can look at your faces and see the look in your eyes and, and know that you understand it even if you're not willing to speak. So that solves the problem. What we'd rather do though is not get all the way to the tolerance. What we'd rather do is we'd rather pick a control limit somewhere inside there. And so this would be the upper upper control limit, UCL, and lower control limit, LCL. And then when we get to the control limit, we can continue making parts because we haven't gone out of spec yet. We can continue making parts, but we have time to decide what to do to fix it. And if it's trending like this and going up, the obvious thing is the tool wore out you can actually adjust the tool offsets. And this is one of the things you're going to be doing in lab coming up is you're going to be adjusting tool offsets to make the part be the size you want. So you may be able to keep using that tool for much longer than that thousand parts by adjusting the tool offsets. And what you'll do is you'll shift the graph down here and then it'll go up again and you can shift it down and it'll go up again. In order to do that, you have to be continuously monitoring the parts as they come off. You have to be doing some sort of sampling strategy or somebody said earlier, if you really understand the process, if the process is in control, then what you can do is you can, um, you can change based on how many parts you made or how much time has elapsed. I don't believe that that is the best method. I believe that measuring the parts as you go is the best method. So we can set upper control limits and lower control limits. Turn my screen sharing back on. And 
All right, so dollars, bring data. Okay, we got data, now what? All right, so we can throw out the bad parts. We can make a control chart. When we get to the process of, so when you want to make a part, first you have to have the idea of the part. I'm actually screen sharing. Now I'm actually screen sharing. When you decide that you want to make something, first you have to have the idea of what it is you want to make. Then you have to have a design. You translate the idea into the design. Then you figure out the processes that you're going to use to translate the design into the physical parts. And so these are either done by the designer or the manufacturing engineer, or if it's an MQP, you wear both hats usually. So you do both of those things. So we, we do this. One of the things we got to do as we get to this point is we have to decide which machine tool are we going to use to make the parts. And in order to decide which machine tool you're going to use to make the parts, you can do these um, CPK and PPK calculations to understand the, um, the capability of the machine tool. So if we're making parts, with our machine, screen share off. If we're making parts with our machine, and so we got number of parts here, and we've got nominal value, and we've got toler lower tolerance, upper tolerance, and we're making parts, and we make a part here, and we make a part here, we make a part here, we make a part here. And, and we're making parts, and we plot the data, and it looks like that. One of the other things we can do is we can plot a histogram of the data and see how many of the parts fall in a certain range. So the other way you can display this, so this is parts over time. Some of them are in the tolerance band, some of them are out of the tolerance band. So we've done this experiment. And this gets back to the evil Santa Claus from yesterday. What he wanted was a normal distribution centered on 50. What we'd really like is a normal distribution centered on the nominal value. It looks like this. So all of our parts fall in here. And so this is the number of parts. But not necessarily in the order they were made, but it's the number of parts. And so we've got a few out here that are small. We've got a few out here that are big. Most of them are right in the center in our, in our range. And if this is our tolerance, we can see that we're not really making too small parts and we're not really making too big parts. So intuitively we would know that this, if this is our capability of our machine, this machine is making good parts and we can use this machine to make the part. If we move in like this, And there's a significant number of parts that are too small, a significant number of parts that are too big. Can we still use this machine to make these parts? Yeah, but it might be better to use a different one. So I can still use this machine to make these parts, but I have to get better at quality inspection and I have to make sure I don't ship these to the customer. And I maybe can put these back in the process and I can remachine them and rework the parts before I ship them to the customer. But the ones that are too small, you may notice on the, on the machine tool controllers when you're in lab, that in the edit row, there's an undo button. You may notice that. 
it does not put material back on the workpiece. You can put material back on the workpiece by putting it in the welder, welding material back on, then putting it back in the machine tool and remachining the material back off. Or you could use some 3D printing processes to 3D print material back on and then remachine it back off. Um, Isabel's almost going to yell at me. It's 11. Yeah. It's time for me to switch over. But as I switch, I want to talk about that undo process in manufacturing because it's totally possible. Um, and is I'm imagining at least half the people in the class have used a 3D printer. And probably half of them have a 3D printer. Right, so we know that there's subtractive manufacturing. That's the stuff that we're gonna focus on in this class where we do material removal. But there's also additive manufacturing and you could put material back and there's processes where you use both of them together. Um, and so, uh, so I, was at a, I was at a meeting and yeah, no, none of the slides were classified. We were doing it in a room that had glass walls and random people walking by. So certainly nothing was classified in the meeting. Um, but I was sitting in the meeting, there was some guys that were gonna present after lunch. And we were talking about a process for repairing parts that have been damaged, aircraft parts that have been damaged. And, uh, and they put up their, their first slide and um, it said, uh, the, the title on the slide was B1B transmission. And, and I figured this was some kind of a part number that we were gonna talk about. But it was actually a picture of the design of the transmission housing for the B1 bomber. And as of the date of that meeting, and I'm sure it hasn't changed now, 100% of the B1 bombers that are flying are flying with a transmission housing that has been repaired. And it has been repaired because where the shafts go through, there's bearings and stuff and vibrations tend to open those holes up. Eventually there's too much vibration because the hole got opened up, it's not gonna work anymore. And transmissions have shafts coming out of them. So what they do is they put it in the shop, they take a MIG welder and they put some material back in, then they heat treat it, then they remachine it. And then they put it back in the B-1 bomber and they go fly to deliver bombs. Um, and we were looking at a different process to do the, uh, the material back in the meeting that I was in. Um, and I think they've done some test parts now, but I don't think they've made me that way. So that is the process for keeping a B-1 bomber in the air. And I just thought it was amazing because when the slide was up there, I thought it was a part number, but no, it was actually the model of the aircraft. That's kind of cool. So what are we doing now? We're talking about modeling. Speaking of models of aircraft, we're talking about modeling. Why do we do modeling in engineering and science? It's not because I like the smell of the glue. Although I do kind of like the smell of the glue. Autofocus. Maybe, autofocus. It looks blurry to me. Did it get better? Yeah, it's normal again. Yep. Okay. Um, why do we do modeling in manufacturing? So you guys can tell me if it's in focus, but you can't tell me why we do modeling in manufacturing science. An idea of the final product. We want to get an idea of the final product. No, couldn't we just make it? It's like, why do we do prototypes, right? Could we just make the final product? It's less expensive. It's less expensive. Okay. So we do modeling because it's less expensive. How do we make, so prototypes are typically more expensive than the final part. Um, but I agree, we like modeling because it cuts expense. It doesn't add expense. But why is modeling less expensive than making the part? Models don't need to be the same size or 
necessarily quality is the final part. You just have to model the parts that you're testing for or looking at. So the model, especially if we think of like a model airplane or a model car or something like that, right? So if we decided the, the geometry for the outside of a new aircraft design that we've come up with, we could make a model of that that's a scale size of it. And then we could put it in a wind tunnel that's smaller, well, assuming we didn't make the model bigger than the plane we meant to build. We could put it in a wind tunnel that's smaller. So it's cheaper to make the wind tunnel, is cheaper to make the model. So that's that's a way to do it. Um, did you guys know there's wind tunnels that you can put cars in? Did you know that there's wind tunnels that you can put cars in that have treadmills so that the ground is moving at the speed that the car is driving? I have visited one of those wind tunnels. Um, uh, Haas, uh, the Haas NASCAR team owns it. It's in Charlotte. Um, it's amazing. They were shooting a commercial for Lexus in the wind tunnel when I was there. And so there was this fancy Lexus in there and they were driving and they get the, the smoke blowing past it and the cameras all light up. Pretty cool. Uh, they use it for Formula One cars a lot too. So we... By the way, that's not the cheap kind of modeling. That's the expensive kind because you're doing it for real. That's testing with a prototype. The cheap kind of modeling. So, so there's, there's the making of physical models and that can make it cheaper to make the prototype. We can test different designs more quickly and for less expense. But what other kind of modeling do we do as engineers? CAD modeling. We do CAD modeling, right? So we can see in the CAD software, do the parts fit together if we make them the size we think we're gonna make them. So we can understand how the parts fit together. Is the assembly gonna do the function that we want it to do? And CAD software has probably reduced the cost of bringing new parts to market even more than CNC machining has. Because when you get to the CNC machining, you still have to do the material removal process. Um, and so, so that kind of modeling is cool. What other kind of modeling might we do in, especially think about modeling in science, not just modeling in engineering. What's modeling in science mean? You model a system like an ecosystem or a population. You could, and, and so what you do when you model a system like that is you're trying to understand how the system works without having to build the system, right? And you can do it mathematically. So what we do when we say we're doing modeling and engineering and science typically isn't making physical models. It's building mathematical models that describe a phenomenon that we've observed. So, um, I think you, you guys have heard of this one, right? F equals MA. I was on the ski team when, uh, when I was a student here at WPI and, uh, and we had sweatshirts and we had F equals MA printed on the sweatshirts because we were the engineer geeks that were on the ski teams traveling around. And I remember there's this girl on the team. Oh, I can't, I have just remembered her name but I'm not gonna say it out loud because that wouldn't be polite, but um, she was, oh, she was built like I am now. Um, and she was one of the best skiers on the team also. And uh, she came in to the, to the, uh, the ski lounge or the, um, the, the place at the bottom where we got warm and took our boots off. She comes in there and she says, F equals MA and I've got the M covered. So, but this, this equation describes a phenomenon, right? So force equals mass times acceleration, right? So F equals MA describes a phenomenon. There, and we have other equations we use that can describe phenomenon. So um, what is profit rate equal? Value minus cost over time. So could we use this equation to model whether or not we should bother to make the parts? 
So we have to make some assumptions to do it, right? But if we could, if we could assume what the value is going to be, and we could determine what the cost is going to be, and we could know the time that it takes to get that value from that cost, then we could we can decide does the profit rate justify the capital investment in making those parts, right? So we could model that. And so this is an equation that we have with, and so part of the problem is value is a function of time, cost is a function of time. So those things, it makes the model more complicated, but if you figured out what is the equation that determines the value, and what is the equation that determines the cost, and what is the time we're talking about, then you could use this equation, the model, to decide whether or not to make the parts. Do we have any other equations we've talked about in the class yet? The equations for a surface speed. So we've got our surface speed. Anybody remember what the equation for surface speed is? So speed in SFM equals, does anybody remember what it equals? It was two times the radius times pi times pi RPM. Times diameter. And then divided by 12 to convert to feet. So we've got a divided by 12 meter per foot. And and multiply by RPM. Pi times diameter. And this is inches per revolution. And that gets this. Times what? Did, did we forget times RPM? Yeah. I thought it was either RPM times four over diameter, or RPM times diameter over four, but I think Right, what is four, four equal? 12 over pi. Four equals 12 divided by pi. I'm an idiot. Yeah, that's why there's a four in that equation on that slide. <clears throat> and honestly, it doesn't matter which equation you use, but I, I'm horrible at memorizing things like equations and dates and things like that. So it, if I know that I can derive the equation, I don't try to memorize it because I know this one I can derive. I can't derive all of them. I wouldn't want to derive all of them, but this one I can, so I never try to memorize what the equation is. Because if I memorize it and I screw it up just a little bit, then I get the wrong answer. Um, all right, so we've got this one. So as we go through the class, well, now we've got the PPK and PP formulas and CPK and CP formulas that we've got on the, uh, on the slide that we were just talking about. It, in that, I'm gonna give you a video to watch that describes that better than I can describe it. And plus we're running out of time, so I don't wanna to try to describe it now. But um, I'm gonna give you a link for a video to watch that talks about the CPK and PPK stuff. But that helps us understand, is the machine gonna work for the parts that we wanna make? Uh, as we get into next week, we're really going to start getting into the math and the physics of, of how that chip forms on the edge of the tool. Remember we had in the, uh, the, the first week we talked about we had a tool here, we have the chip sliding up the face of the tool, we had the workpiece going this way, so the workpiece is going that way, the tool is going this way, right? And we said that that the way that the cutting happens right here has to do with that surface speed. So this V here is surface speed. So we're gonna examine this in detail next week and we're gonna understand what's actually happening to the material in this zone where the shearing is happening. Why is it that the T1, this uncut chip thickness is almost always smaller than this E2 the cut chip thickness, right? And we're gonna see if we change this angle here, how does that impact the energy that it takes to make the cut and the forces and stuff? So next week, we're gonna get in detail involved in doing the math and the physics of this chip formation on the edge of the tool.
before we start doing that, I get this assignment that I want you to do, and it's going to start, and you're going to be building this throughout the term. But we're going to, and I don't care if you use Excel or Numbers or whatever the thing is that's built into the Mac or Google Slides or, I mean, Google Sheets, Google Sheets, we call it. I don't care which software you use to do this. I used to tell you how to use Excel. We will give you an example. We, I used to have TAs when I taught this class and the TAs were the ones that prepared the example. So I would say we, I will give you an example. They took all the TAs away um, of what the Excel file should look like. And I've got a video that shows how I made the example Excel file. But what I want you to do in that Excel file, and I'll give you some specific problems in the assignment, but it's gonna to be to make a mathematical model in Excel that solves, that solves the problem I've given you, that answers the question. And so if it's the, if it's the speed one, if I'm telling you what the surface speed is and the diameter is, I want you to be able to tell me what the RPMs are. If I tell you what the, the RPMs are, and the service speed is, I want you to be able to tell me what the diameter is. And so you're gonna have input cells and you put the numbers in the input cells and there's an output cell that does the calculation for you. So that's, that's the idea of this model so that when you get to a quiz question that asks you to convert service speed to RPM, all you do is go into your Excel file, you type the numbers in, you get the answer and you type it into Canvas and then your quiz is done like, like that. It's hard to snap left-handed holding the cap to a marker. Um, so that's what that's about. We're, as I said, we're gonna build this throughout the term. Every time we get to a new equation, I want you to put this in your Excel thing so that at the end of the class, when you do the comprehensive final, it takes you 15 minutes because all the answers are already in your Excel file and all you gotta do is type in the numbers. And we'll be going through doing this stuff. Um, what are we talking about tomorrow? Anybody remember? Surface metrology. Oh, yeah. It's going to have to be somebody's job to shut me up tomorrow. I have a PhD in surface metrology. It's a topic I could talk about a lot. In fact, the study of services is why I'm here teaching you guys. Yeah, I'll try to keep it concise and not make you need a PhD to understand what we're talking about. But tomorrow we're gonna to talk about service metrology. I believe that all manufacturing processes, the only purpose of any manufacturing process is to create a specific service and put it at a specific location. That's the purpose of all manufacturing processes. Um, well, it's the fundamental ones where we're actually cutting stuff or making stuff, casting, forming, machining, cutting. All those things are about making a specific service, putting it in a specific location. You often have to use many processes to get the surface you want at the correct location. Um, so yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, oh, and... Don't forget to tell me if you got something, well, if you think there's something wrong with your grade. And don't forget to tell me early if you think there's something wrong with your grade so I can fix it early so we're not doing it after the class is over because it is really boring for me to try to fix your grade after the class is over and the next class has started and I'm worried about those people's grades. So if you care about your grade, let's talk about it early. It's like voting in Chicago, do it early and often. Wait, no, not often. I will try not to make mistakes, you try not to care about them. Um, that's good. This one, there is a live video, so it'll get posted right after class. The other one, you can watch the seven minute video and it basically tells you everything I spent an hour talking about yesterday. Um, maybe I'll make a seven, seven minute version of this one too. And I'm gonna give you the videos about uh, CPK, PBK and Six Sigma. This is a good 20 minute video. It's really good. It talks about this really well, better than I could ever talk about it. Anybody else? Any questions? Anybody feel like jumping for joy?
I saw some arm movement, but I didn't see any jumping. Let's see some jumping. Wait, you guys can log off. I'm just going to keep exercising. Um, I'll, just, I'll stick around in case anybody has questions. Oh, 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 discussion forum. If you have questions about the CAM assignment, post them in the discussion forum. There's people watching the discussion forum waiting for questions so they can answer them for you. You're not obligated to figure out how to do this stuff by yourself. What machine, Y block operation one and machines, what is, oh yeah. You come to the lab and you're either set to a lathe or to a mill. If you're sent to the lathe, you machine the cylinder. If you're sent to the mill, you machine the Y block operation one. And um, the next time you come to the lab, you do the other one. Unless we screwed up the schedule. In which case we'll fix the schedule so that it happens that way. All right, I'm gonna log off. Thank you, Professor. Did you have a question? Okay, thank you. Yeah.